Chapter Twenty Six. While Madame Cibot's back was turned, Fraisier nimbly slipped a sheet of blank paper into the envelope. The will he put in his pocket. He next proceeded to seal the envelope again so cleverly that he showed the seal to Madame Cibot when she returned, and asked her if she could see the slightest trace of the operation. La Cibot took up the envelope, felt it over, assured herself that it was not empty, and heaved a deep sigh. She had entertained hopes that Fraisier himself would have burned the unlucky document while she was out of the room. "'Well, my dear Monsieur Fraisier, what is to be done?' "'Oh, that is your affair. I am not one of the next of kin myself. But if I had the slightest claim to any of that,' indicating the collection, "'I know very well what I should do.' "'That is just what I want to know,' La Cibot answered with sufficient simplicity. "'There is a fire in the grate,' he said. Then he rose to go. "'After all, no one will know about it but you and me,' began La Cibot. "'It can never be proved that a will existed,' asserted the man of law. "'And you?' "'I? If M. Ponce dies intestate, you shall have a hundred thousand francs.' "'Oh, yes, no doubt,' returned she. "'People promise you heaps of money, and when they come by their own, and there is talk of paying, they swindle you like—' like a magus she was going to say but she stopped herself just in time i am going said fraisier it is not to your interest that i should be found here but i shall see you again downstairs la cibot shut the door and returned with the sealed packet in her hand she had quite made up her mind to burn it but as she went towards the bedroom fireplace she felt the grasp of a hand on each arm, and saw Schmucke on one hand, and Pons himself on the other, leaning against the partition wall on either side of the door. La Cibot cried out and fell face downwards in a fit. Real or feigned, no one ever knew the truth. This sight produced such an impression on Pons that a deadly faintness came upon him, and Schmucke left the woman on the floor to help Pons back to bed. The friends trembled in every limb. They had set themselves a hard task. It was done, but it had been too much for their strength. When Pons lay in bed again, and Schmucke had regained strength to some extent, he heard a sound of sobbing. La Cibot, on her knees, bursting into tears, held out supplicating hands to them, in very expressive pantomime. "'It was pure curiosity,' she sobbed when she saw that Pons and Schmucke were paying attention to her proceedings. "'Pure curiosity! A woman's fault, you know! But I did not know how else to get a sight of your will, and I brought it back again!' "'Go!' said Schmucke, standing erect, his tall figure gaining in height by the full height of his indignation. "'You are a monster! You tried to kill mein gut Pons! He is right!' You are worse than a monster, you are a lost soul. La Cibot saw the look of abhorrence in the frank German's face. She rose, proud as Tartuffe, gave Schmucke a glance which made him quake, and went out, carrying off under her dress an exquisite little picture of Metsu's pointed out by Elie Magus. A diamond, he had called it. Fraisier, downstairs in the porter's lodge, was waiting to hear that La Cibot had burned the envelope and the sheet of blank paper inside it. Great was his astonishment when he beheld his fair client's agitation and dismay. "'What has happened?' "'This has happened, my dear Monsieur Fraisier. Under pretense of giving me good advice and telling me what to do, you have lost me my annuity and the gentleman's confidence.' One of the word tornadoes in which she excelled was in full progress, but Fraisier cut her short. "'This is idle talk. The facts, the facts, and be quick about it.' "'Well, it came about in this way.' And she told him of the scene which she had just come through. "'You have lost nothing through me,' was Fraisier's comment. "'The gentlemen had their doubts, or they would not have set this trap for you.' They were lying in wait and spying upon you. You have not told me everything, he added, with a tiger's glance at the woman before him. 
i hide anything from you cried she after all that we have done together she added with a shudder my dear madame i have done nothing blameworthy returned fraisier evidently he meant to deny his nocturnal visit to pons's rooms every hair on la cibot's head seemed to scorch her while a sense of icy cold swept over her from head to foot what she faltered in bewilderment here is a criminal charge on the face of it you may be accused of suppressing the will fraisier made answer dryly la cibot started don't be alarmed i am your legal adviser i only wish to show you how easy it is in one way or another to do as i once explained to you let us see now what have you done that this simple german should be hiding in the room nothing at all unless it was that scene the other day when i stood m pons out that his eyes dazzled and ever since the two gentlemen have been as different as can be so you have brought all my troubles upon me i might have lost my influence with m pons but i was sure of the german just now he was talking of marrying me or of taking me with him it is all one the excuse was so plausible that fraisier was fain to be satisfied with it you need fear nothing he resumed i gave you my word that you shall have your money and i shall keep my word the whole matter so far was up in the air but now it is as good as banknotes you shall have at least twelve hundred francs per annum but my good lady you must act intelligently under my orders yes my dear monsieur fraisier said la cibot with cringing servility she was completely subdued very good good-bye and fraisier went taking the dangerous document with him he reached home in great spirits the will was a terrible weapon now thought he i have a hold on madame la présidente de marville she must keep her word with me if she did not she would lose the property at daybreak when remonencq had taken down his shutters and left his sister in charge of the shop he came after his wont of late to inquire for his good friend cibot the portress was contemplating the metsu privately wondering how a little bit of painted wood could be worth such a lot of money aha said he looking over her shoulder that is the one picture which m elie magus regretted with that little bit of a thing he says his happiness would be complete what would he give for it asked la cibot why if you will promise to marry me within a year of widowhood i will undertake to get twenty thousand francs for it from elie magus and unless you marry me you will never get a thousand francs for the picture why not because you would be obliged to give a receipt for the money and then you might have a lawsuit with the heirs at law if you were my wife i myself should sell the thing to m magus and in the way of business it is enough to make an entry in the day-book and i should note that m schmucke sold it to me there leave the panel with me if your husband were to die you might have a lot of bother over it but no one would think it odd that i should have a picture in the shop you know me quite well besides i will give you a receipt if you like the covetous portress felt that she had been caught she agreed to a proposal which was to bind her for the rest of her life to the marine store dealer you are right said she as she locked the picture away in a chest bring me the bit of writing remonencq beckoned her to the door i can see neighbor that we shall not save our poor dear cibot he said lowering his voice dr poulain gave him up yesterday evening and said that he could not last out the day it is a great misfortune but after all this was not the place for you you ought to be in a fine curiosity shop on the boulevard des capucines do you know that i have made nearly a hundred thousand francs in ten years and if you will have as much some day i will undertake to make a handsome fortune for you as my wife you would be the mistress my sister should wait on you and do the work of the house and 
a heart-rending moan from the little tailor cut the tempter short the death agony had begun go away said la cibot you are a monster to talk of such things and my poor man dying like this ah it is because i love you said remonencq i could let everything else go to have you if you loved me you would say nothing to me just now returned she and remonencq departed to his shop sure of marrying la cibot towards ten o'clock there was a sort of commotion in the street Monsieur Cibot was taking the sacrament. All the friends of the pair, all the porters and porters' wives in the Rue de Normandie and neighboring streets, had crowded into the lodge, under the archway, and stood on the pavement outside. Nobody so much as noticed the arrival of Monsieur Leopold Anakin and a brother lawyer. Schwab and Brunner reached Pons's rooms unseen by Madame Cibot. The notary, inquiring for Pons, was shown upstairs by the portress of a neighboring house. Brunner remembered his previous visit to the museum, and went straight in with his friend Schwab. Pons formally revoked his previous will, and constituted Schmucke his universal legatee. This accomplished, he thanked Schwab and Brunner, and earnestly begged M. Leopold Anakin to protect Schmucke's interests. The demands made upon him by last night's scene with La Cibot, and this final settlement of his worldly affairs, left him so faint and exhausted that Schmucke begged Schwab to go for the Abbé Duplanty. It was Pons's great desire to take the sacrament, and Schmucke could not bring himself to leave his friend. La Cibot, sitting at the foot of her husband's bed, gave not so much as a thought to Schmucke's breakfast for that matter had been forbidden to return but the morning's events the sight of pons's heroic resignation in the death agony so oppressed schmucke's heart that he was not conscious of hunger towards two o'clock however as nothing had been seen of the old german la cibot sent remonencq's sister to see whether schmucke wanted anything prompted not so much by interest as by curiosity the abbe duplanty had just heard the old musician's dying confession and the administration of the sacrament of extreme unction was disturbed by repeated ringing of the door-bell pons in his terror of robbery had made schmucke promise solemnly to admit no one into the house so schmucke did not stir again and again mademoiselle remonencq pulled the cord and finally went downstairs in alarm to tell la cibot that schmucke would not open the door fraisier made a note of this schmucke had never seen any one die in his life before long he would be perplexed by the many difficulties which beset those who are left with a dead body in paris this more especially if they are lonely and helpless and have no one to act for them fraisier knew moreover that in real affliction people lose their heads and therefore immediately after breakfast he took up his position in the porter's lodge and sitting there in perpetual committee with dr poulain conceived the idea of directing all schmucke's actions himself to obtain the important result the doctor and the lawyer took their measures on this wise the beadle of saint francois cantinet by name at one time a retail dealer in glassware lived in the rue d'orleans next door to dr poulain and under the same roof madame cantinet who saw to the letting of the chairs at saint francois once had fallen ill and dr poulain had attended her gratuitously she was as might be expected grateful and often confided her troubles to him the nutcrackers punctual in their attendance at saint francois on sundays and saints days were on friendly terms with the beadle and the lowest ecclesiastical rank and file commonly called in paris le bas clergé to whom the devout usually give little presents from time to time madame cantinet therefore knew schmucke almost as well as schmucke knew her and madame cantinet was afflicted with two sore troubles which enabled the lawyer to use her as a blind and involuntary agent 
Cantinet Jr., a stage-struck youth, had deserted the paths of the church and turned his back on the prospect of one day becoming a beadle to make his debut among the supernumeraries of the Cirque Olympique. He was leading a wild life, breaking his mother's heart and draining her purse by frequent forced loans. Cantinet Sr., much addicted to spirituous liquors and idleness, had in fact been driven to retire from business by those two failings. So far from reforming, the incorrigible offender had found scope in his new occupation for the indulgence of both cravings. He did nothing, and he drank with drivers of wedding coaches, with the undertaker's men at funerals, with poor folk relieved by the vicar, till his morning's occupation was set forth in rubric on his countenance by noon. Madame Cantinet saw no prospect but want in her old age, and yet she had brought her husband twelve thousand francs, she said. The tale of her woes, related for the hundredth time, suggested an idea to Dr. Poulain. Once introduce her into the old bachelor's quarters, and it will be easy by her means to establish Madame Sauvage there as working housekeeper. It was quite impossible to present Madame Sauvage herself, for the nutcrackers had grown suspicious of every one. Schmucke's refusal to admit Mademoiselle Remonencq had sufficiently opened Fraisier's eyes. Still, it seemed evident that Pons and Schmucke, being pious souls, would take any one recommended by the abbé with blind confidence. Madame Cantinet should bring Madame Sauvage with her, and to put in Fraisier's servant was almost tantamount to installing Fraisier himself. The abbé Duplanty, coming downstairs, found the gateway blocked by the Cibot's friends, all of them bent upon showing their interest in one of the oldest and most respectable porters in the Marais. Dr. Poulin raised his hat and took the abbé aside. "'I am just about to go to poor Monsieur Ponce,' he said. "'There is still a chance of recovery, but it is a question of inducing him to undergo an operation. The calculi are perceptible to the touch.' They are setting up an inflammatory condition which will end fatally, but perhaps it is not too late to remove them. You should really use your influence to persuade the patient to submit to surgical treatment. I will answer for his life, provided that no untoward circumstance occurs during the operation. I will return as soon as I have taken the sacred ciborium back to the church, said the Abbe Duplanty for M. Schmucke's condition claims the support of religion. "'I have just heard that he is alone,' said Dr. Poulain. "'The German, good soul, had a little altercation this morning with Madame Cibot, who has acted as housekeeper to them both for the past ten years. They have quarrelled, for the moment only, no doubt, but under the circumstances they must have someone in to help upstairs. It would be a charity to look after him.' I say, Cantinet, continued the doctor, beckoning to the beadle, just go and ask your wife if she will nurse Monsieur Ponce and look after Monsieur Schmucke, and take Madame Cibot's place for a day or two. Even without the quarrel, Madame Cibot would still require a substitute. Madame Cantinet is honest, added the doctor, turning to Monsieur Duplanty. You could not make a better choice, said the good priest. She is entrusted with the letting of chairs in the church. A few minutes later Dr. Poulain stood by Pons's pillow, watching the progress made by death, and Schmucke's vain efforts to persuade his friend to consent to the operation. To all the poor German's despairing entreaties, Pons only replied by a shake of the head and occasional impatient movements, till, after a while, he summoned up all his fast-failing strength to say, with a heart-rending look, Do let me die in peace. Schmucke almost died of sorrow, but he took Pons's hand and softly kissed it, and held it between his own, as if trying a second time to give his own vitality to his friend. Just at this moment the bell rang, and Dr. Poulain, going to the door, admitted the Abbe Duplanty. 
our poor patient is struggling in the grasp of death he said all will be over in a few hours you will send a priest no doubt to watch to-night but it is time that madame cantinet came as well as a woman to do the work for m schmucke is quite unfit to think of anything i am afraid for his reason and there are valuables here which ought to be in the custody of honest persons the abbe duplanty a kindly upright priest guileless and unsuspicious was struck with the truth of dr poulain's remarks he had moreover a certain belief in the doctor of the quarter so on the threshold of the death chamber he stopped and beckoned to schmucke but schmucke could not bring himself to loosen the grasp of the hand that grew tighter and tighter pons seemed to think that he was slipping over the edge of a precipice and must catch at something to save himself but as many know the dying are haunted by an hallucination that leads them to snatch at things about them like men eager to save their most precious possessions from a fire presently pons released schmucke to clutch at the bedclothes dragging them and huddling them about himself with a hasty covetous movement significant and painful to see what will you do left alone with your dead friend asked m l'abbe duplanty when schmucke came to the door you have not madame cibot now ein monster dat have killed bons but you must have somebody with you began dr poulain some one must sit up with the body to-night i shall sit up i shall say de prayers to god the innocent german answered but you must eat and who is to cook for you now asked the doctor grief have taken away mine appetite schmucke said simply and some one must give notice to the registrar said poulain and lay out the body and order the funeral and the person who sits up with the body and the priest will want meals can't you do all this by yourself a man cannot die like a dog in the capital of the civilized world schmucke opened wide eyes of dismay a brief fit of madness seized him but mons shall not die he cried aloud i shall save him you cannot go without sleep much longer and who will take your place some one must look after monsieur pons and give him drink and nurse him ah that is true very well said the abbe i am thinking of sending you madame cantinet a good and honest creature the practical details of the care of the dead bewildered schmucke till he was fain to die with his friend he is a child said the doctor turning to the abbe duplanty ein child schmucke repeated mechanically there then said the curate i will speak to madame cantinet and send her to you do not trouble yourself said the doctor i am going home and she lives in the next house the dying seemed to struggle with death as with an invisible assassin in the agony at the last as the final thrust is made the act of dying seems to be a conflict a hand-to-hand -hand fight for life pons had reached the supreme moment at the sound of his groans and cries the three standing in the doorway hurried to the bedside then came the last blow smiting asunder the bonds between soul and body striking down to life's sources and suddenly pons regained for a few brief moments the perfect calm that follows the struggle he came to himself and with the serenity of death in his face he looked round almost smilingly at them ah doctor i have had a hard time of it but you were right i am doing better thank you my good abbe i was wondering what had become of schmucke schmucke has had nothing to eat since yesterday evening and now it is four o'clock you have no one with you now and it would be wise to send for madame cibot she is capable of anything said pons without attempting to conceal all his abhorrence at the sound of her name it is true schmucke ought to have some trustworthy person m duplanty and i have been thinking about you both ah thank you 
I had not thought of that. And Monsieur Duplanty suggests that you should have Madame Cantinet. Oh, Madame Cantinet, who lets the chairs, exclaimed Pons. Yes, she is an excellent creature. She has no liking for Madame Cibot, continued the doctor, and she would take good care of Monsieur Schmucke. Send her to me, Monsieur Duplanty. Send her, and her husband, too. I shall be easy. Nothing will be stolen here. Schmucke had taken Pons's hand again, and held it joyously in his own. Pons was almost well again, he thought. Let us go, Monsieur l'abbé, said the doctor. I will send Madame Cantinet round at once. I see how it is. She perhaps may not find Monsieur Pons alive. <laughs> 